Thank you for the special. Thank you for singing and thank you for being here. Take a Bible, please. Find the book of Mark, the eighth chapter. I'll give you just a moment to get there with me. Mark chapter eight in your Bible. And hasn't it been a great day in Michigan? And I'm glad you're here and I'm so glad I got to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Howe, for letting me come to this and hosting me. And uh, where's Brother Ryan? Pastor Ryan, thank you for all the work you did. And uh, we appreciate you and all the effort and all the work and all the labor and all the workers. Give them all a round of applause, would you? And a lot of, a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money. And thank you, Pastor Hal, for the message today, too. That was good, tender-hearted, and it really spoke to my heart. I was in the second session there and enjoyed that very, very, very much. And uh, did, you, uh, did, you, did you correct me in that first session, too? Did you? Did you no, you just... <laughs> Uh, how many of you? How many of you were in here when he challenged my theory? How many of you were in here? Well, I just, I just have to tell you, Pastor Hal, that you should never compare the Garden of Eden to Hades. You just shouldn't do that. That's not theologically accurate. I'm not sure where you went to college, but you need to check that out right there. That, that, uh, that would not theologically be accurate. But uh, what, a, what a joy to be with you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for. Uh, just uh, listening to me so kindly and treating me so graciously. In honor of this day, my family, I've told you about my family, haven't I? In honor of this day for lunch, my family went to Buffalo Wild Wings and sent me photos. And uh, so I missed it because I'm with you. But uh, that's what my family did today. And I'm, I'm uh, sad I missed them, but I'm thrilled I get to be with all of you legit teenagers here at the youth conference. And uh, just for the record, in my book, y'all are lit. And... Uh, and I'm just really, really happy. Where's Rochester Hills Baptist Church Youth Group? Raise your hand. Let me real high. Now, their pastor is a friend of mine, Reverend Hal Hightower. All of you teens that know Brother Hightower, raise your hand good and high. I need you to do me a favor. When you see him tomorrow, I want every one of you to give him a group hug from his favorite evangelist, Dave Young. And if you'll do it, I'll be there this fall in a meeting, and I'll buy y'all coffee. If you'll give him a group hug and somebody take a picture and send to me, all right? And if you'll do that, coffee on me, all right? And uh, that will be worth it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be worth it? That'll be worth it. That will be worth every dime. And uh, I hope you teens will do that. That'll just cement our friendship for sure. All right, you got your Bible ready? Mark chapter 9. By the way, you know I'm a dad, don't you? I love dad jokes, don't y'all? Y'all know my all-time favorite, don't you? If you've heard me preach, you've probably heard my all-time favorite dad joke. Why did the lifeguard refuse to rescue the hippie? Because he was too far out, man. <laughs> See, that was worth coming to this conference for, wasn't it? You know why Piglet always smelled badly? Do you know why Piglet always smelled bag badly? Because he played with poo all the time. <laughs> That's was really bad. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have told you that one. I'm in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. And the Bible says these words in Mark 8 and verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will, everybody say those two words, whosoever will. One more time. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous, and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I preached to you in our first session this morning on the subject, Come Unto Me. And I want to preach to you in this session on the words of our Savior Jesus, Follow Me. I want to talk to you about follow me. How many of you are aware that teens are notorious followers? How many of you are aware of that? 
Are you aware of that? It's okay. It's not a bad slam on you. It's just the way God designed your youth. In your teen years, teenagers especially are notorious followers. Like a new game on the internet, every teen has to have it. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about there. And then by the time people my age get on board, y'all change the game. And I just want you to know that's not right. You ought to at least give us old people time to gain up, you know, and, and catch up with you. Uh, when it comes to games or clothes, how many of you are aware that teenagers will wear almost anything if it's in style? How many of y'all are aware? Are you aware of that? And it's hilarious because teens will make fun of older people. They will. I know teenagers that would laugh at pictures of their grandparents or their parents who in the 1960s wore bell-bottom pants. I know teens who will laugh about that, except I was in the mall the other day, and I saw teens wearing bell-bottom pants, and I fell to my knees and said, oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> Surely that's not coming back. I thought that was one fashion that would never do the circuit, but it's back. And you know what's amazing about teens is they follow it. They just do. When uh, Hollywood said, you know what, if you'd pull your pants down to your kneecaps and pull your underwear up under your arms, you'd be cool. <laughs> You know what teenagers said? I'm in! I'm in! And, and some are still wearing it, and they're now in their 30s. All right, if you're in your 30s and your pants are still pulled down to your kneecaps and your underwear pulled up under your arms, it's time to get a life, okay? It's time. Somebody needs to come along with a staple gun, pull those pants up, and staple them to somebody's hips. Are y'all with me on that? Uh, teens don't wear anything. Now, here's what's even funnier, because when I was a teenager, I was a teenager, I was not permitted to wear shorts. You know why? Because, number one, we were right-wing religious, all right? But number two is because in my day, shorts were really short. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen those? In my day, when you wore shorts, you showed the whole leg. And, and, and it, was, it was, yeah, it's just about as gross as it seems. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry. It's just like, oh, my word. You know, I, I, guys, you know, guys' legs are guys' legs, but they're hairy, okay? I saw a meme of Abraham Lincoln, and it said, I thought about shaving once. And at the bottom it said, and then I thought, no, I like my legs the way they are. <laughs> so kudos to the beard, all right? Now, here's what's amazing about teenagers. A few years ago I was preaching to teens, and I told stories about the shorter shorts. And I'm serious as I You know what every teen did in my, my youth conference that night? I'm talking about... In my day, men wore shorts. None of these culottes for guys. We were short. And I had teenagers, when I mentioned, like, guys wearing shorts, you know, the shorts, they were all like, ah, it's gross. But I was in the mall the other day. And they're back. I was at a camp two years ago, and I made fun of those shorts. And every child in the room cheered me on. I was at camp last summer, and half the teens were already wearing them. You know it. Teens are notorious followers. You know the difference in juniors and, juniors and teenagers? It's the difference in chickens and cows. Y'all, farmers, any farmers in the room? I love farming. I'm a big farming fan. I was raised on a farm. I like cows. Any cow fans in the room? I like cows. You know what you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. You know what you call a cow with no front legs? Lean beef. <laughs> you know how the farmer found his wife? He tracked her. <laughs> you know what you call a cow that just had a baby? Decaffeinated. <laughs> how many of you agree that the jokes are very moving? Those are utterly not funny, are they? <laughs> I could go on, but I will stop right there. Say amen to that. Uh, now, here's the whole idea. Cows and chickens are very different. When it comes to juniors, I used to work at camp, and I'd spend my summers at this Christian camp working with juniors, and juniors are like the chickens on my farm. You know what chickens will do? They're everywhere. Chickens like, there's a chicken over here, and one over here, and one over here, and there's chickens just, just get it. You try to drive chickens, and it's not going to work. Try to lead them. Come on, chick, 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 chick. No, not a chance. You can't drive chickens. They just, they're everywhere. Teenagers are wonderful because they follow. They're like cows. If you ever drive along the interstate and you see a farm on the side of the road, you, you'll see this somewhere along the way. And you remember Dave Young said teens are like cows. When you see this, remember Dave Young said that teens are just like that. You'll see, you'll see a, a, a whole field over here of cows. And you'll see one cow, she'll, she'll raise her head and see something off in the distance. 
Who knows what it is because I can't read cow minds. She sees something off in the distance and here she goes in that direction. And the funniest, I've seen this happen hundreds of times. Here she goes, wherever, we don't know what she's thinking. We don't know what she's thinking. We don't even know if she's thinking. See, she is like a teenager. And uh, <laughs> we, just, we just don't know. So here she goes in a certain direction. And here's the most amazing thing. That every time that happens, you'll see cows all over the field. They all lift their head up and they look at her. And they all start with her. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what's over there. But she's going and I'm going with her. I love teenagers. Because teenagers are followers. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. God designed you that way. We can't ridicule about it. And how many of you know that you can get in trouble following the wrong crowd? How many of y'all know that? It's the truth, isn't it? A lot of teenagers have made some real stupid, forgive that word, have made some real, we don't say that word, have made some real stupid mistakes in their life because they followed the wrong crowd. But can I suggest to you something, ladies and gentlemen? Nobody, 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 nobody has ever gone wrong following Jesus Christ. And you won't be the first. How many of you are aware that everybody follows somebody or something? It's just not a bad thing. Everybody follows. Everybody does. Some follow bitterness. Bitterness creeps into their life, and they follow it the rest of their life. You know why some of your parents are angry? Because when they were your age, they let bitterness come into their life, and they've never dealt with it, and that bitterness has turned into anger. They're still following that bitterness from years ago. That's no way to live. Obviously, some follow fashion. Fashion just cracks me up, whether it's hip-hop or let's cut holes in our jeans and pretend like we work for a living. I saw, I saw these curls at the mall somewhere long ago. And, you know, I've seen, you know, most people like a hole here and a hole there and a hole here and a hole there. But these girls, it was like from here down, like there's somebody had shred in a weed eater their pants. And so loving teenagers the way I do, I said, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Are you guys okay? And they were like, what? what, what? I said, did, did, did somebody die? I, who did you get in a fight with? And they were looking at me like, who is this idiot old man talking to us? And I said, well, your pants. I just saw somebody to hurt you really badly. Are you guys okay? And they called security and uh, not really, but. Some follow fashion, some follow bitterness, some follow their friends. Jesus invites us in the message from this morning to come to him. In the message this afternoon, before you go, he invites you to follow him. Four answers. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Four words to help you evaluate. They're going to be familiar to you. Four words. The first one is, there is an invitation. Secondly, there's a frustration. Thirdly, there's a limitation. And fourthly, there's a declaration. Memorize those four points again. You ready? The first one is there's an invitation. What's number one? Invitation. invitation frustration. What's the first one? Invitation. Second one? Frustration. Then there's a limitation. Don't you wish all quizzes were this easy? There's an invitation. There's a frustration. There is a limitation. And last of all, there is a, how many already got it? a declaration. Look with me please at the invitation. In your Bible, in the 34th verse, he called the people unto him with his disciples and he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, anybody, 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 you say, Dave, I don't know a lot about the Bible. I don't know a lot about Christianity. I don't know a lot about church. My family doesn't go to church. My family, I'm the only one in my family that ever goes to church. My mom and dad are separated. Whoever, whoever you are, whatever your situation, maybe you've been in church all your life. How many of you are like that? How many of you guys say when you were just really young, you just feel like you've been saved all your life, although you haven't been, you feel like you have. How many of you are like that? My wife's that way. I got saved when I was a teenager. My wife got saved when she was like four. She has a lousy testimony. And she got saved when she was four. He didn't go to church and I get I tell you, I was, my life was a mess and I was in drugs and I, I was at the bottom and I heard the gospel and Jesus reached down and pulled me up and I, I've never been the same. My wife's testimony, uh, I was four. I'd tried everything. I'd been around the block twice on my tricycle. And I got saved. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? 
Praise God if you got saved when you were four or five or six or seven. It took as much of the grace of God to save you from a life of sin as it does to save an older person out of a life of sin. Jesus says anybody, anybody, whether you got saved when you were young or you just got saved last week, anybody, whether you're the oldest person in this room or the youngest, anybody, anybody, every boy, every girl, every teenage girl, every teenage guy, every mom, every dad, every single person, every messed up person, every cleaned up person, anybody, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, let him follow me. What's Jesus trying to say to us in this 34th verse? Dedicate yourself to being the real deal Christian. How many of you appreciate people that are the real deal? Don't you, teenagers? Teens can be brutal, can't they? They can spot fake a mile away. How many teens in this room hate fake? You hate a hypocrite? You hate somebody that's a fair? You hate it. Teens hate it. Now, the fact is, be honest and be fair. Chances are, if you were as hard on yourself as you are on some others, that'd make a big difference in your life. But having said that, it's also true, isn't it, that teens hate fake. So let me say to you this afternoon, then stop being fake. Are you saved? Then be the real deal Christian. Jesus says, look, come after me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. It's time somebody in this room dedicates yourself to being the real deal Christian. In other words, somebody here has got to say, all right, I'm going to tell you, I'm leaving youth conference this Saturday afternoon, and I'm going home, and Jesus is going to be first in my life. Jesus first. That's a real deal Christian. Church faithfully. That's a real deal Christian. The Word of God fervently. That's a real deal Christian. Is there any evidence in your life that Jesus is first? You say you're saved. You hate fake. You hate a fraud. You hate somebody that's phony. And I just want to ask you, is there, is there any evidence at all that Jesus is first in your life? Any evidence? A channel that you changed. I changed that channel because Jesus is first. Any evidence? An app deleted. Jesus is first. I deleted that app. I signed up for TikTok and got on, found out there was garbage on there, and I'm done with it. Because I'd rather have a clean heart than be cool. Would you, would you delete Instagram if in your life it turned into Insta porn? Any evidence that Jesus is first? An error challenge? When's the last time you challenged an error in one of your peers? Somebody told a dirty joke in your Christian school and you said, just hold on a minute. Not while I'm around. Not if I have anything to do with it. I'm a Christian. Are you following Jesus? Is there any evidence? Is he first? An apology offered. How many of you, how many of you, uh, how many of you have parents in your life that have sometimes really blown it with you. Anybody got a parent like that besides my kids? Your parents ever blown it with you? How many of you, how many of you there are times your dad or mom should have apologized, but they didn't? Come on, nobody but us. Has ever happened in your life? How many of your mom and dad ever apologized to you? Said I was wrong and I'm sorry and will you forgive me? Has it ever happened in your life? Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you apologized? When's the last time you were harsh with your brother or sister and you apologized for it? When's the last time you responded incorrectly to your mom or dad and you apologized for it? Why? Because Jesus is first. You say, you know, I, mom, I, mom, can I talk to you a moment? Hey, mom, i got to tell you something. I shouldn't have said what I said to you a moment ago, and I'm embarrassed that I said that. And will you forgive me for saying it? Is Jesus first? If I were preaching your moms and dads, I'd be saying to them, when's the last time you apologized because you got harsh with your son or daughter? Now, I'm not preaching to your mom and dad, I'm preaching to you. So when's the last time you apologized to your mom and dad because you were a jerk? Is that okay to say? You're not offended, are you? Is Jesus first in your life, young people? Any evidence? A channel changed, an app deleted, an error challenged, an apology offered, a no stated emphatically no no hey we got this party this weekend we're gonna have a few beers and a little party it's not a big deal you know we just we're just it's okay it's not like we're gonna you know blow up the bank or murder anybody just drink a little bit no no i'm a christian not not alcohol in my life 
Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Which is the Bible way of saying, you mess around with alcohol, you're playing the fool. See how it's just, it's just a little bit. I love it when teenagers in our generation or millennials in our generation are like, well, no, the Bible says, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Now, there's two things that verse says that we always overlook. Number one, it says, drink no longer water. That's what it says before it says to use a little wine. So if you're going to take that verse, it's okay to drink, then stop drinking water. Now, obviously, that wouldn't make sense. But when's the last time you stood up and said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to that party, there's drinking there. No, I'm not coming over to your house. No, I'm not watching that movie with you. When's the last time you evidenced that Jesus was first? The invitation is to be the real deal. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. The invitation is whether or not you are going to be the real deal. When's the last time there was a sermon you responded to? Now, it's easy at youth camp or a youth conference because everybody does. When's the last time in your service, in your church, where you call it your home church, that you responded to the Word of God? Any evidence that Jesus is first when people in your church watch you in church? You have your Bible open? Now, it's not wrong to have an app, necessarily. I have an app. I have my iPad here. I have an app. I'm not opposed to apps. Apps are a little dangerous in church because often apps are connected to the internet and the first time you get a notification, you no longer have any idea what the preacher is saying because you are conditioned by technological advances to respond to every notification as soon as possible. I've never opened my Bible and gotten a notification that distracted me reading my Bible. But I have been on my app before and gotten a notification that distracted me. So maybe as a teenager, it might be wiser for you to get you a copy of God's Word and start carrying a book to church and pay attention to God's Word that way. Now, if you take an app and you're using it and you're growing, I'm not fussing with you. God bless you. Use the app. I do about 30% of the time because uh, I can see it. Because half the time now I can't see my Bible and I'm at this age where my teenagers love making fun of me because I'm doing a lot of this. And don't you make fun of me because your day's coming. Before you know it, you'll be doing this. And some of you guys will be doing it without hair. At least I have my hair, okay? And it's coming your way, so just buckle down and hold on. Don't make too much fun of your parents. My kids are always like my son Jacob is the, you know, he thinks he's always funny because I'll be in a church where they don't put the words on a screen, which is just not of God because I can't see hymnals. So my son will be like, all right, all right, Dad, let me help you. Can you see it now? And I use smart aleck teenager. And, 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 and it's, it's true. So I, I use my app. I'm not opposed to using an app. But when's the last time you were in church with a Bible open or an app open and your heart was in tune with the Word of God because Jesus is first? Right. Is that a fair question? You teens hate. You hate. Hypocritical, phony. You hate it. But I'm asking you, what about your life? Jesus, anybody can come to me. Anybody can deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And I'm asking you, how are you doing? Forget your parents. Forget the other teenagers. How are you doing? Are you a Christian or not? Is Jesus first in your life? When's the last time there was a sermon you responded to? Or a response different from that around you? So many teenagers roll their eyes and sigh at their parents. But are you a Christian or not? See, I hate it when my mom and dad are so angry and treat me the way they treat me. But has it dawned on some of you kids that you're in danger of becoming your parents? Because you're reacting to them the same way they treat you. Somebody's got to man up. Somebody's got to Christian up. Somebody's got to wisen up and say enough is enough. Mom and dad may be wrong, but I don't have to be. I can honor God and keep God first. When's the last time you were at church and you greeted a guest warmly? My teenagers have been in well over a thousand Baptist churches in 46 states. And sometimes my teenagers go into a church where they're the stranger. Not one teenager welcomes them. My teens have gone into youth group Sunday school meetings and sat alone, and nobody welcomed them. 90% of the time, if my kids make a friend in a church, they're the ones who initiate it. 
I get it. My kids are the evangelist kids, and we're going to get over it and move on. But what do you do when an unsaved kid who doesn't know a thing about Jesus Christ walks into your church and you treat him that way? I'm just asking, is there any evidence that Jesus is first? Do you sing with all your heart when you're at church? Do you smile? Do you take notes? Do you respond? When's the, when's the last time you responded to an adult respectfully? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mom. Yes, sir, Dad. I'll do that. Dad, can I know? Okay, Dad. That's what you say. I'll do it. I'll respect you. Here's the invitation. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus Jesus is challenging us to dedicate ourselves to being the real deal Christian. And Jesus is challenging us to dedicate ourselves to making a difference for Christ in a sin-cursed world. Can I ask you a question? What difference are you making for Jesus Christ? You're making a difference with your siblings? How many of you have a brother or sister? Do you have any spiritual impact in their life? Your generation wants to change the world, but you can even treat your siblings graciously. See, I mean, it's my little sister. I got bad news for you, son. That sister of yours, chances are if you get married, you're going to marry a girl. She's going to be just like your little sister. You know why God gave you that sister? To prepare you and train you to show you how you should respond to ladies. See, I mean, she's so emotional. How do I say this? You, you, you're going to marry a, a, a person of the female species. God made them to be emotional. That's how God designed them. Some guy's like, oh my word, my wife's so emotional. I always say to him, with all respect, shut up. <laughs> you're what? You're, God made her that way. It's not like God's shocked that your wife has some emotions. Some of you guys could use some. Some guys are like, Here I am. Well, emotion's good. Girls, you treat your brother with respect? What difference are you making for Christ? Some of your kids go to Christian school. Are you making any difference for Christ in your school? You guys and girls that go to a public school, God bless you. Your public school needs your light to shine brightly. Shame on you if you're just another one of the teens in school. You listen to the same music they listen to, talk the same way they talk, act the same way they act, respond to things the same way the world responds to them. You are called of God to be all in for Jesus Christ. So is there any evidence? That's my question. Any evidence in your life? Could anybody that knows you say, I can tell you right there's a real genuine Christian young lady, and here's four reasons why I know she is. How about you boys? I knew your best friend and your best friend was straight up nothing but honest and I said to your best friend hey tell me is he the real deal how would your best friend answer that question I don't know many of your moms and dads but if I could say to your mom and dad your son or daughter are Christian yes they're Christian tell me is there any evidence that they're the real deal what would your mom and daddy say would your mom say I know my daughter's the real deal and here's four reasons why I know my son's the real deal, Dad says. And here's a few reasons why I know it. The words of Jesus are, are deeply spiritual, but shockingly practical. Here's an invitation. You've got to decide whether or not you're going to dedicate yourself to following Christ, to keeping him first, to being the real deal, to go all out for Jesus Christ. I call it being all in. How many of you play sports? You ever had a teammate who wasn't all in? Isn't that annoying? They halfway play, they barely show up, they couldn't really care less. That's annoying. Anybody likes a person that's all in. How many of y'all know somebody and they're not real good at what they play, but they are all in? How many of y'all know somebody like that? You know somebody like that? You can thank God for a guy that's all in if he's not really good, right? He, he may not have a clue, but he's got his whole heart's in it. See, God's not looking at your life and going, you know what, if you teens were only smarter, I could use you. God is looking at your life, you know, if you, guys, if you guys just had more money, I could use you. God designs you. God loves you. And Jesus says in this passage, come unto me, come unto me, follow me. 
who, anybody that wants to can come to me, follow me, deny themselves, take up their cross. And I'm telling you, Jesus is saying here, you do it, it'll be worth it. So there's the invitation. Y'all with me on the invitation? Follow me. Here's number two. Here's number two. There's not only an invitation in this passage. Would you notice with me, please? Notice with me, please. There's a frustration. How, how many of you have ever had a massive frustration in your life? You ever had that happen to you? You ever been really frustrated? I, uh, I finished a revival last year in, uh, where was it? Temple, Texas. 757 miles from Temple, Texas to home. I don't get home very often. So when I have a week down and I can, I make a beeline for home. So I can be in my house, in my bed, and catch up on some stuff at home. So we finished this meeting, Temple, Texas. I had my RV, my truck, my RV. It was a 40-foot fifth wheel. I had a van with us. We had an intern from a college in North Carolina who had spent the week training. The, uh, Saturday morning, we decided to drive home to Pensacola. Knowing I was going home, I booked him a flight Sunday afternoon out of Pensacola. I got to get to Pensacola because he's got to fly out of there. We left very early. It's a 700 and some miles with a car that's a long ways with an RV. It's astronomical. So I said to the family, all right, you guys, you guys all get in the van and just hit the road. The intern and I will get in the truck and trailer and we'll come behind you. So sure enough, my family got in the van, headed for home, came out of Texas through Houston, hit I-10 through Louisiana, through Baton Rouge, through New Orleans. They're going home. They're way ahead of us. The intern and I got in the truck and trailer, hit traffic in Houston, Sat in traffic in Houston. Traffic is always frustrating. Sitting in traffic in Houston. Sitting in traffic in Houston. Did I mention sitting in traffic in Houston? Finally got through Houston. We get out of Houston. We hit the Louisiana border. We're making pretty good time now. I normally drive way under the speed limit because I'm pulling a 40-foot fifth wheel with 20,000 pounds behind me. It takes a long time to stop a 40-foot fifth wheel at 20,000 pounds of weight and so I drive a little slower than normal, but the interstate was moving pretty good, so I had a hammer down, man. I had a hammer down, beautiful day. We're making pretty good time. Just, just on the western side of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, my truck just went, <laughs> middle of the interstate died. Just died. I eased over to the side of the interstate, got off as far as I could before, you know, I blocked two lanes of interstate traffic. I got out, and you know what all guys do? I raised the hood, and I looked. That was no help. I looked again. All looked good to me. So now I'm sitting on the side of the interstate with an intern that needs to get to Pensacola, a 40-foot fifth wheel behind me, and I don't know where in the world I am. So I finally got my GPS out and realized what exit I'm near. And so I realized, you know what, I'm 30 minutes from Baton Rouge, and I know a pastor in Baton Rouge, so I called the pastor in Baton Rouge, and I said, has anybody in your church got an RV, uh, I mean a pickup that can pull an RV, who would come and get my RV? My truck died, and I'm on the side of the interstate here to exit such and such. And he said, hold on a minute, I'll call you back. 30 minutes later, he called me back and said, I found a guy in my church, he's got a pickup truck, and he's coming to get your RV. And so he said, call a record for your truck. So I called the tow, and the guy came and took my truck. Then another guy came and hicked up my RV, and, and the pastor of the church said, you can park the RV at my house until the truck gets repaired. So I got on the, air, the, the phone and I called the Baton Rouge, Louisiana airport and I rented a car to go get the car. I went to the airport to get the car, to go back to the RV, to pack all of our stuff into the car, to drive to Pensacola. And when the truck gets repaired, I'm gonna drive back with the car, drop it off at the airport, go pick up my, it was frustrating. So the guy comes, he gets my truck, he tows it off. The guy comes and we get in his truck and hitch up my RV. He drives me through the, through the airport and drops me off to get the rental car, me and the intern. So I go into the counter and I said to the lady, I'm here to pick up a rental car, Dave Young. Oh, she said, I got your reservation right here. That'll be da 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 da. And I said, all right, here you go. And I handed her my Discover card. The only credit card I had with me was my Discover card. Here it is. I handed it to her. My son had borrowed my master card and didn't give it back. So all I had was my Discover. So I handed it to her and she said, I'm sorry, it's declined. So I'm like, excuse me? It's declined. So hold on a minute. So I called Discover card. My card, I'm trying to use it at the airport, it's, de it's, it's declined. She said, I'm very sorry. But she said, somebody hacked your card this morning, so we shut it down. 
I said, well, can you open it again enough that I can get this car? No, I'm sorry, but we mailed a new one to your house. It should be there within five to six days. I'm like, I gotta get home. So I said, oh, okay, I said to the intern, excuse me, I said, hey, uh, can you, uh, you got a credit card? Or can, can we use his credit card? She said, how old is he? I said, he's 21. She said, I'm sorry, he has to be 25. I go, are you kidding me? So I finally called a pastor. My RV's at his house. I said, Pastor, I need a favor. Will you come up to the airport and rent a car in my name with your card? Add me as a driver so I can go to your house and pick up my stuff out of the RV and take this intern to Pensacola so he can, you know, get a flight out in the morning? So the pastor comes up to the airport, rents the car, adds me as a driver. We drive down to his house. We put everything in the car. By now, it's like 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, and it's, it's still a long ways to Pensacola where I call home. So we get in the car. At midnight, we roll into Pensacola, and my intern is staying at a missions house at a Baptist church right off the interstate in Pensacola. So I take the exit. It's midnight. I get to this traffic light, it's red, I wait, the light turns green and I have an arrow, and I turn, and I, as I turned, there was a little old lady, 80 some years old, who had been out apparently partying, who ran the traffic light and creamed the pastor's rental car. Just ran over it. Can I say frustrating? Do you know what my intern did? My intern got out of the car, laid on the hood and laughed loudly enough to wake up all the neighbors. <laughs> he said, this is awesome. I didn't know you could have days like this. This is awesome. This is so awesome. And I'm thinking, you're going to meet Jesus. <laughs> awesome nothing. This is the most frustrating day of my life. I'm trying to get home. I'm tired. I've been up since 4 a.m. And my trucks broke down and my trailer's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a strange pastor's house. And I'm driving a rental car and, and it just got, you know, run over by a little old lady. And what in the world? And he's laughing hysterically <laughs> because he obviously needed revival. <laughs> it was frustrating. How, how, many, how, many of you, how many of you just know what it is to sometimes have frustrations in life? But you know, Jesus here is reminding us yet again that life is filled with frustration. What's yours? Is it your parents' divorce? Is it a person that did you wrong? Is it the brokenness of your family? How many of you are aware of the fact that every person in this room is in danger of losing your life? Yeah. That's what he's trying to say here. For what, whosoever, he says in verse 35, will save his life, shall lose it. Will lose it. You can live your life in such a way that your entire life is a series of frustrations. Are you aware that life is more than money? Are you aware that it's more than fun? Are you aware that life is more than stuff? and more than status, and more than fame and fortune, and more than issues. Life is frustrating. So Jesus is addressing life's frustrations, and the question is, what are you going to do about them? You're going to live your life and put up with all the frustrations of life, or you can follow Jesus and let him walk with you through the frustrations of life. The first word is invitation. The second word is Frustration. The third word is limitation. Go back into verse 34 again. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Say those words. Let him. Deny One more time. Deny and take up his cross. Take up his what? Cross. Listen to the words of your Savior Jesus. How many of you are saved in this room on your way to heaven? Wave your hand at me. Listen to the words of your Savior Jesus. You want to follow him? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. What's he talking about here again? Limitations. You're okay with limitations, aren't you? Limitations are a part of life. How many of you are driving? How many of you know there's a reason why we have a speed limit? Are you all aware of that? I love, I love, I absolutely love motorcycles. All my life I've ridden motorcycles. My dad let me buy my first motorcycle when I was 11. I went in debt for a motorcycle when I was 14. My dad signed the loan. 
so I could buy a motorcycle. I have all my life loved motorcycles. I have a friend who loves motorcycles more than I do, and he makes a ton of money buying, selling, repairing, investing in motorcycles. Recently, a year ago, actually, a year ago, a year ago, I was in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. I'll fly back there tonight. A year ago, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, and my friend called me on a Saturday night and said, hey, Brother Dave, I got a new bike. You want to ride it? I was like, oh, yeah. What is it? It's a 900 Ducati. He brought me a 900 Ducati to my motel, parked it outside my motel, gave me the keys. Now, he said, we got a little problem with it, Brother Young. He said, I haven't been able to, to repair it. I just bought it. It's got some issues. I'm going to resell it. I'm going to work on it and sell it. He said, it's fully insured, so don't worry about riding. It's fully insured. He said, uh, uh, you, you ought to really take it a, for a spin here and get used to it. He said, you've got you to kind of feather the throttle. In other words, the, the, it was having a little trouble with the acceleration, and, and you, you really had to keep the throttle, the, the, you had to keep it revved pretty high to keep it from stalling on you. So he said, here, you ought to take it. I said, well, let me take it for a spin. I'll just take it for a spin. I'll ride it tomorrow afternoon. He, so I jumped on it, cranked it up. Boom, boy, it roared. It was, oh, man, beautiful red Ducati, 900 Ducati. So I got on this motorcycle. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. you're not going to ride like that, are you? So what do you mean? He said, not my bike. You got to put a helmet on. All right, so I put a helmet on. <laughs> Limitations, got to wear a helmet. So I put a helmet on. He said, now, here, put my leather jacket on. Put this leather jacket on, zipped it up. He said, and here I got riding gloves too. So he put these gloves on me, these compression fitted gloves. There. And uh, I jumped on his motorcycle. Oh my word, the thing roared. <clears throat> it was beautiful. I pulled out of the parking lot of the motel. Oh, it was this beautiful evening. Beside my motel was this huge industrial park. Saturday night, every factory back there is closed. Nobody's back there. I thought this is the place to ride this bike. So I jumped on that bike, I pulled out. My son watched me. I pull out, I'm roaring, I'm roaring. Nobody's back there, so I can speed a little bit. So it was just one long straightaway, and I was going pretty good, gunning it. I'm top gear. I came around this curve, the curve went like this, and then it straightened up again. There were two buildings, big, pretty good-sized buildings on my left. I straightened up, and there's a long straightaway at the ends of the cul-de-sac, and I thought, I'll open it up, I'll open it up, turn around, go back to the motel, and I'll be done. So I came on that curve, I hit that straight away, I gunned it. Last time I looked down, I was going 70. When I looked back up, there were three deer. Three deer came running out between those two buildings right in front of me. Three deer, 70 miles an hour, three deer right in the road with me. So, did the only thing you can do, I laid her over. 70 miles an hour, I put that bike over. It was a very memorable occasion in my life. Damaged the helmet, took the, took the face mask off, it landed over there, crashed it, put scratches all down the helmet, scratched up the leather jacket. I uh, had a pair of jeans on, and uh, for one time in my life, I was cool. I ripped the jeans right here. <laughs> and I also took the hide right off my knee. It was beautiful. It was about that big. No skin. Oh, it was beautiful. And I had a nice pair of boots on, docker boots that I bought. I ripped the whole side of those docker boots. They were shredded. So I stand up. I still got a helmet on. My bike's laying over there. Well, his bike's laying over there. And uh, I was shaking so badly. And I saw those deer running. And in my heart, I said, oh to God, I wish I had a, a rifle. I know three deer that would meet Jesus in a heartbeat. The Lord called him home, I mean her home and her home and her home and they're gone. I'm telling you, it was tough. I was, I was, I was shaking. So I, they, they ran off. They're gone. And I reached over and I pulled the bike up. And believe it or not, there wasn't much wrong with it. Put a scratch that size on the paint job. I uh, took the turn signal off. Put a little scratch on the accelerator and the, the brake there. And, and, and I broke one little brace on the side. And so I stood it up, started it, it, it fired up. I rode it back. <laughs> Parked it. Said to my son, Jake, you got to take me to Target before we call your mom. <laughs> and um, we went to Target, and I, I did something that obviously I wasn't thinking. I bought this spray antiseptic because I knew my knee was dirty, so I had to get that cleaned out. 
So I went in, I bought this spray antiseptic, and I got in, and I pulled my pants leg up, and I said to Jake, I said, I gotta get this clean real good, and this says this will clean out any wound. So I shook it up real good. I, I wasn't thinking, okay? I just, sometimes even adults don't think, okay? And I took that thing and I was like, and I felt like somebody took about 6,000 needles and just jammed into my knee. Oh, I levitated, and I'm not even a magician. It's like, are you kidding me? I, I, I hurt. I, I hurt so bad. I'm telling you, I, I promise you, I, I made a vow before God, never again will I buy antiseptic spray. <laughs> made a vow. I broke my hand. Broke my hand that night. Sore this morning when I got up. It's hard doing push-ups. I'd be careful doing push-ups. Body's like this, don't come cheap. <laughs> but, uh, I'm doing push-ups. I can hurt that hand right there. It's still sore. It's been a year now, but it's still sore. See, it was limitations that saved my life. Yep. Had I not put that helmet on, you, you wouldn't have to hear me preach. If I hadn't worn that leather jacket, I'd have scraped up more than my knee. Yeah. If I hadn't had that glove on, I'd have probably demolished my right hand. Limitations Amen. helped me. And I've come this afternoon, and I'm almost done. Say to you teenagers in this room, don't you balk at limitations. Jesus says, you're going to follow me? You've got to deny yourself and take up your cross. I'm just backing up again and saying to you, you've got to live differently than the world around us. There's some places you can't go, some things you can't wear, some, some movies you can't watch, some apps you shouldn't download, some friends you shouldn't hang around. I don't know how far you should go with it because there's a lot in the Bible that the Bible leaves up to your conscience and the leading of the Holy Spirit, and I understand that. When I got saved as a sophomore in high school, I determined to be all in for Jesus. For me, it meant I didn't go to the prom. I didn't go. Mom and Dad was okay if I went. They didn't care. If you want to go, it's fine. But I didn't go because I don't listen to that rock music anymore. I didn't go because I don't. I don't drink. I didn't go because the girls dressed like they were trying to work in a gentleman's club. And I was trying to have a pure heart and a clean heart. Because I was following Jesus, there were limitations. I'm not going to the prom. I was the public school vice pre or president, rather, of the junior class. I was supposed to give the speech to welcome everybody to the prom. That was the responsibility of the president of the junior class. So when I said I can't go, it was public. When I said I couldn't go, it was a big deal. But it was worth it because I was following Jesus. I don't know what it means for you to follow Jesus. I'm not even saying you shouldn't go to the prom. As far as I can tell, the Bible never says, Thou shalt us not as to go us to the promised. At least I've not read it in my Bible. Maybe you have one that does, but mine doesn't say anything about that. But I'm asking you, is Jesus first, and are you following him? There's frustrations in life, and you can either spend the rest of your life with the issues of anger and bitterness and all the curse of sin that we live around and let it affect your life, or you can put Jesus first and follow him. Am I making sense this afternoon? It's almost time to go. Are you with me? You with me? There's an invitation. Follow me. There's a frustration. You can lose your life in this sin-cursed world. You can die with a bigger house than anybody else in this room has and yet die with nothing. You can have nicer cars than anybody in this room can afford and yet die alone. There's frustrations you've got to deal with. There's limitations you've got to embrace. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. you got to say no. you got to stand against this garbage-filled world and do what's right. Not every guy in the world is looking at porn. Not every guy. And you should be one of the not every. Not every guy in this world is going to the parties and boozing it up with his buddies. And you should be one of the not every guy or not every girl. Limitations are vital and important. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And Jesus closes this section with a declaration. You got your Bible still open? 
Jesus says in this passage, Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. Three things and I'm done. In this declaration, Jesus offers a better way, a better worldview, and better worth. Are you aware that the reason Jesus asked you to come after him and to follow him is because it's a better way to live? Are you aware of that? It's a better way to live. Jesus is offering you a better way to live. Now, teens, I'm telling you, that's an important statement. Because you're living in a culture today that ridicules Christianity and says, no, 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 Christianity is stupid. Socialism is a better way to live. No, 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 Christianity is stupid. Abortion is a better way to live. No, 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 Christianity is stupid. Pornography is a better way to live. And God says to you in this text, no, 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 no. You can lose your life you live that way. Your life will have no purpose, no value, and won't be worth living. Or you can come after Jesus and stand for the truth and do what's right, and you'll find out that that is a better way to live. How many of y'all know what opposites are? Like, what's the opposite of off? It is... What's the opposite of cold? What's the opposite of night? We would say the opposite of white would be... What's the opposite of wrong? It's tricky a little bit. The opposite of wrong, most of us would say, is right. But I want to suggest to you, not biblically, the opposite of wrong is better. See, here's what most of you think. All right, all right, I got to do right, fine. Stop it. Stop living that way. Jesus doesn't want you to just be a Christian because it's the right thing to do. He wants you to be a Christian because it's the better thing to do. It's a better way to live. Uh, does it shock you if I tell you I'm 50? Is that surprising to y'all? I know I look so young, but I just celebrated my 50th birthday a few days ago. So I'm 50 now. I know it's, it's, hard, it's even hard for me to think about. 50. I'm 50 years old. I'm, I, I confess, I'm, I'm, I've joined the old club. Here I am. And uh, I, uh, I've been a Christian a long time. And teenagers, I could stand here the rest of this day. I could stand here the rest of this day and tell you over and over and over and over again that Christianity is better. One of my buddies from high school saw him some years ago. He said to me, Dave, I just don't get you. He said, life just seems to work out for you. Yeah, he and I are the same age. I'm still married to my first wife and happily married. I wasn't kidding when she, when I told you that she calls me handsome hunk of man. I wasn't kidding. She does. The woman, she can just hardly keep her hands off of me, people. It's just, it's my cross to bear, okay? The woman just loves me. And I would just tell you I love her. We're, you, know, you know what, my, my wife and I go on a date at least once a week. We, uh, we believe that part of our calling is to embarrass our children. Hey, we, we hold hands everywhere. If we go to amusement parks, we make out on all the rides just because we're married. We are happily married. See, my friend, he's been through divorce, frustrated with life. My kids, my kids are living it up, serving the Lord. And that's the truth. We're not perfect. Don't, don't get me, we're not perfect. We're having the time of our life. Because Jesus says, you live for my sake in the Gospels, you know what you'll find out? You'll save your life. Yep. It's the Bible way of saying it'll be worth it. It's worth living that way. I, I would love, I would love to have a Corvette. Red, I want a red one. Red Corvette, quad exhaust, six-speed transmission, convertible top. I want it to roar. When I leave the house, I want people to know Dave Young's leaving. Yep. I just want it. I don't, it only seats two people. I know that, and I have five kids. People always say, what'd you do with the kids? Who cares? <laughs> Bethany and I would look great. All right? Now, here's the deal. Chances are I'll never own a Corvette. Chances are I never will. Oh, okay, fine. I have a friend. He has a blue one. 2017 model, blue, convertible, red brake system. You can see through the tires. He heard me preach this a few months ago, and his wife came out afterwards, and she hugged me, and she said, we were going to give you our Corvette until we found out you wanted a red one. We were friends. 
Here's what, here's what some people will tell you. If you'll serve Jesus, you'll have health and wealth. It'll be easy and glorious and great. But I've come to this session to tell you that's not true. God never promises you you'll drive a Corvette or that your wife will call you handsome hunk of man. God never promises you that. But God does promise you that he'll bless your life and that he'll use your life. Do you know that there are blessings in life far bigger than a Corvette? Yes, sir. This summer, in the month of June, I went to Dallas, Texas, because my son Joshua married a young lady named Bethany. It's a beautiful wedding. She loves the Lord and loves him, and he loves the Lord and loves her. And they're on staff at a church in Camarillo, California, and happily serving God and having the time of their life. They're doing really great, except the other day they bought one of the ugliest little dogs I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and uh, so I'm praying for my son. He, he's, he's really struggling there spiritually, I think. But other than that, he's doing really well, really well. Two weeks after I saw them get married in Texas, I was in Pensacola for my daughter's wedding. Two weeks later, my Abigail got married. It was a beautiful wedding. I got to walk her down the aisle. Somebody said to me, you going to cry? I said, no, I'm not going to cry. They said, why not? Daddies always cry at weddings. I said, well, maybe I will, but I got to tell you something. I couldn't be happier. I love the guy she's marrying. I've trained her to marry him. They're going to serve God together. I trained her to leave, and she's leaving. Woo, praise God. She's expensive. Now he gets to pay. This is great. It's a win-win all around. He's a good man. He loves the Lord. They're serving God together. Woo, I'm telling you, this was a great day in my life. I walked her down the aisle. My friend Mike himself is an evangelist, and he did the part about... Who gives this woman to this man? And I happily said, her mother and I gloriously and happily do. So Micah prayed, and while he's praying, I came up, and then I did the wedding. I'd love to have a Corvette, but I'd take a good wife for my Joshua and a good husband for my Abigail any day. Right over houses and lands and yeah. cars and money and vacations and stuff. Yeah. What Jesus is trying to tell you is there's a better way to live. Son, if God lets you make millions of dollars, live for Jesus. Right. Don't go buy million-dollar mansions that are empty. Mm -hmm. Buy yourself a normal house and use the rest of it to make a difference in the world for Christ. Amen. And some of you ought to be in the ministry. I'm not one of those weird guys that thinks that if you're in the ministry, you are a cut above everybody else, and God bless you, you are a man of God, and you're more spiritual than everybody else. I believe everybody ought to serve the Lord. And for some people, that means you ought to be in ministry. I, I even hesitate to say to teenagers, now how many of you will surrender your lives to be a preacher? Because for crying out loud, some of you can't even make your bed yet. I mean, uh, just be honest, am I right? I'm telling you to make a life-changing decision when you haven't yet learned how to make your bed? So what I say to you instead is, maybe God wants you to preach, but surrender your life and say, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. Whatever it is, I'll do it. Right. And if God wants you in the ministry five years from now, then get in. Yep. And if God wants you to stay in a local church five years from now and serve in that local church and tithe in that local church and support missions in that local church and sing in the choir in that local church and be greeters in the parking lot of that local church and do great things for God and raise your kids for Jesus Christ and have a happy marriage, then serve God with all your heart. And you'll find out it's worth it. I'm trying to land this plane. This is a tricky thing for me because I like to land a plane when I feel like people are getting it, but y'all are tired. So y'all are just looking at me which means I keep preaching because I feel like you're not getting it. We could be here a long time if you don't join me, people. I can't end until I feel like you're on board. Jesus is inviting you to follow him. Jesus is inviting you to live your life for the gospel. What are you doing to impact a world like yours for Christ? There's a better worldview. It's not just a better way to live. It's a better worldview. What's wrong with the wet and leaks and, and, and all these people that have all these questions about Christianity? It's a worldview problem. Everybody has a worldview, and a worldview is the answers to the important questions of life. An evolutionist has a worldview. 
The LGBTQ has a worldview. God wants you to have a Christian worldview. A worldview that says, I am created in the image of an almighty God. I am saved by faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And giving my life to him and living my life for the gospel is a, is a life worth living. And it pays off and it makes a difference. And when it comes time for me to die, my life will have counted for Christ. That's a worldview worth having. Some of you, the only thing you're going to ever do, you'll never preach like I am at a youth conference, but some of you are going to have a family someday and you can raise all seven of your children for Jesus Christ. And you'll die someday and your seven children will applaud your life because there's a daddy that touched my life for Jesus Christ. And now I have a Christian home and now I have Christian children because my daddy at a youth conference in 2020 at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport got all in for Jesus Christ and lived his life for Jesus Christ. And here I am now, 45 years old, and my life is different because I had a dad and a mom at a youth conference who decided to follow Jesus. And that's what Jesus is trying to say to us. Come unto me. All ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Hey, 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 whosoever will, let him come after me. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. So how do I end this sermon? I, I guess you have to decide that. I'm so glad at the age of 16 that I said to God as a new Christian, God, I have no clue what the future holds, but I want my life to count for you and for the gospel. And I, I'm serious. It's been glorious. Have there been valleys and heartaches and problems and trials and challenges? Sure. You live in a sin-cursed world, expect it. But I have a loving, gentle, Gracious, amazing, heavenly Father. Amen. And so do you. How many of you would determine this afternoon to put God first in your life, Christ first? To leave here and say, you know what, I'm going to leave here the real deal Christian. How many of you today would be willing to say to Jesus, I don't know what the future holds, but I want my life to count for the gospel. The family that I will someday have, if in fact you want me to be married, God, my family, my family will be a gospel family. My marriage will be a gospel marriage. I wonder if there's anybody here who would be willing to just stick your neck out a little bit farther and say, God, if you wanted to use my whole life for the gospel, I'd be willing. I don't know that you need to make an announcement. God's called me to be an evangelist or God's called me to be a missionary. But every one of you ought to leave today saying, you know what, God, I don't know what the future holds for me. I'm young yet, but I'm all in. If you want me to spend the rest of my life in Africa, I'm going to Africa and having the time. I'm going to have a great time doing it. If you want me in Siberia, I'll go to Siberia and have fun doing it. If you want me, God, to serve you in Mexico, I'm going to Mexico and I'll have fun doing it. If you just want me to get a, a job and serve in my local church and help with the music or help with the teens or help with the children's program or lead the nursery or clean the building, I'll just do it and I'm all in and I'll have fun doing it. God, I'm all yours. And I want to follow you. And I want you first. There's a young man in this room right now, son. You're the only one in your family. You're the only one in your family. There's a girl, you're the only one. Your mom and dad don't care what you do. Your siblings don't care what you do. But there's a God in heaven who cares and wants to bless your life in spite of your family. Yes, right. So let him. Yep. Let him. Get all in. My wife, ever so often, wants to go and see stuff that I have no interest in seeing. Like my wife and her mom several years ago went to the Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina. A sprawling mansion built by a millionaire family years ago as their vacation home. It's empty. It's, for all practical purposes, kind of useless. All those thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars so people can go in and go, wow, somebody wealthy built a big home. Then there are men like D.L. Moody, who also had millions of dollars and gave almost every dime of it 
to impact the world with the gospel. Orphanages, schools, churches, Bible colleges. His money counted for Christ. You don't know the name Leslie Arwood, do you? I wouldn't expect you to. But that is the man that stepped into my life when I was 15, the real deal Christian, and led a young teenage boy named Dave Young to Jesus Christ. I've been able to preach 46 states, six countries. We've seen thousands saved. We've planted churches in Haiti, Belarus, the Philippines. We started a Bible college in the Philippines. We had 500 students this semester, all because one man, one man was the real deal Christian. As far as I know, I may be the only person he ever led to Jesus. I sure thank God he did. What are you going to do with your life? Here's how we're going to give the invitation. I'm going to ask every pastor, every staff, every adult that came with your church to join me here at the front and line up across the front of the room here in just a moment. I'm going to ask every one of you teenagers this afternoon, every one of you who are willing, who are willing to come after Jesus, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him, live for his sake and the gospels. I'm going to ask you to find the adult that brought you, the pastor, the youth pastor, the youth worker. The, I'm going to ask you to find them and say to them, I'm willing. And then to kneel somewhere in this room and with every ounce of your being to say to God, I'm leaving today to follow you. That's my invitation. If you haven't been saved, I'm going to have several standing at the back. Will you help me with that, Pastor? Will you make sure you have a couple of staff people at the back? People at the back will be available to pray with you. There's, there's two right there. Here's three right here. Here's a man in the pink tie. You're one of the staff guys, aren't you? You're or one of the church people. And you pray with people. So we got several ladies. Look back there right now. If you don't know you're going to heaven and you want to know you go to the back and meet these ladies and men. They'll be looking for you, ready for you. We want you to leave here on your way to heaven and know it. The rest of you, you know Christ. You come and tell your pastors and youth pastors and pastors' wives, I, I'm leaving here to follow Christ. And then pray about it. Will you guys come on, you adults, pastors, youth pastors, your wives? Just kind of line up. This is a big auditorium, so line up. Line up across the room. These are here, people to pray with you. You can even line up maybe partially in the aisle if there's too many of us. Nobody here but us. Teens, look at me. While these are responding, how many of you teens would say, David, I'm serious as I know how to be. I know Christ is my Savior. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. Wave your hand like this at me if you know that for sure. I know that's most of you. I'm so happy for you. How many of you would say, Dave, I'm telling you the truth. I want to be all in. I want my life to count for Jesus Christ. How many of you say that's true in your life? All right, that'd be a lot of you, wouldn't it? So here's what I want you to do. The pianist in a second is going to play. As soon as she starts playing, I want to challenge you teenagers to close this conference by finding somebody from your church and saying to them, I'm all in, and then find a place in this room to kneel. In fact, what I want you to do is you come, and then why don't we go towards the back to kneel, all right? There's a lot of us, but let's kneel. Kneel and mean it with all of your heart that you're going to follow Christ. Would you do that? Father, right now, pour out your spirit in our lives. Help us to sincerely dedicate ourselves to follow our Savior, to make a difference in a world that is cursed by sin. Pour out your Spirit in the lives of these teens. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Stand to your feet. The pianist is playing. Step out and come. Tell them, I mean it. I'm going to follow Christ. I just want you to know I'm going to follow Christ. And then kneel at your seat or kneel in the back and pray. Just pray. Take your time to get through the crowd. Find your pastor, your youth pastor's wife, the adult that brought you. Say, I'm going to follow Christ. Tell them, I'm going to follow Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want Jesus first. Just tell them those words. And then go find a place to kneel. Find a place to kneel. You can come up on the platform if you want to, teenagers. 
You can come on the platform to pray if you want. There's room up here to pray. There's a choir loft. Just come on up here and pray if you want. I'm all in. Mean it. You sincerely mean it. I'm all in for Christ. I'm going to follow Christ. Say it. Say it. Pray it. Say it and pray it. I'm all in for Christ. Say it, pray it. I'm all in for Christ. Say it and pray it. You that are still standing there, don't feel pressured. I don't want you to respond to anything because of pressure. But you that are standing there, how many of you would have to be honest that you don't know Christ as your Savior? If you've never been saved through Jesus Christ, we're available to pray with you as well. You'll find counselors at the back. They're looking for you. Many of them are wearing the shirt, just like I'm wearing the pullover. You go back and shake their hand. We'll help you to know you're going to heaven. We'll help you to know Christ as your Savior and your God. It's almost time to go. We have just a few moments here. If all is well in your life and you didn't need to respond, will you pray for the teens who did? Will you bow your head and pray for the teens around you who are responding? Say it and pray it. I'm all in. I'm going to follow Christ. He's first in my life when I leave here today. Say it. Pray it. finished, turn your seat. Folks are still praying. Just keep playing and waiting. Bow your head across the room for a moment, will you? How many of you would say, David, I know for sure that Jesus Christ is my God, my Savior. I've been born again through Jesus Christ, and I know that for sure. Let me see that by your upraised hand, will you? I'll take those down. Keep your heads bowed just a moment. Is there anybody in the service? And you'd say, David, I don't know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. I want to know Christ. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that I'm a Christian. Anybody anywhere in the building? Would you like somebody to pray with you? Can they? There's a counselor right there beside you. Amen. Amen. It's time. Amen. Say a word of prayer for her. Counselor's praying with this young lady. Somebody else, Dave, I want to know I'm saved too. And I don't know that I'm going to heaven, but I want to know. Anybody else? Don't be ashamed. Just lift it. I can see it. We'll get a counselor right to you. Anybody else at all? I don't know Christ, but I want to know. I want to follow Christ and be born again. I want to be saved. I want to trust Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Am I missing anybody? Just look at me and wave your hand. If that's you. How many of you know this song that she's playing? I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you know it? When she finishes this verse, I want you to sing it with her. I have decided to follow Jesus. Sing, would you? I have decided. Sing it again.
Father, in the mighty name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, we come into your presence with thanksgiving that you sent your Son to die for our sins, to be buried, to be raised from the dead, so that through him we can have eternal life, and through him we can have abundant life. Father, I don't know the needs and the hearts and the situations represented in this room, but you do. And every one of these young men and these young ladies have a life that can count for your sake and the Gospels. May we never be the same. Because in the first service, we just came to you with all of our trials and problems and burdens and cares. And in the second service, we determined to follow you, to deny ourselves and take up our cross. Lord, if there's one thing I know, it's that we can't do it. We're hopeless, we're nothing, we're helpless. So right now, oh God, I pray that you'll pour out your spirit in the heart of every teenager who's made these decisions this day. Fill these young people with your power, with your strength. Give them wisdom that comes from you. Help them to do right, to take right stands as you lead them, to reach out into a world so darkened by the philosophies of evil to make a difference by truth to live it to see life that results I love you Jesus thank you that I could address these young people today thank you for the just the wonderful privilege it's mine to serve you thank you for being so good to me bless my friends here in a mighty way and I ask all of these things this afternoon, God, through the name of your Son, my Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your kindness. You can be seated. Come unto me. Follow me.